I'd like to bring up a couple of regional vice presidents from Genworth, uh, Scott Westfall and Justin Shipman, and they're going to talk about uh, practice management. And, and this is one of the one of the best presentations I've seen uh, uh, from an insurance company uh, to address uh, uh, kind of how to to overall look at your practice. And and so I would encourage you to really take notes and and grab these guys afterward for some questions. So coming up, gentlemen. All right. Thanks, Eric. So there are two people that I hate following, right? One is a comedian because they're getting everybody, you know, laughing, everybody having a good time, and I'm an insurance guy, right? Hard to follow a comedian. And also a principal of a BGA because I can't kick them off the stage, right? So and I know that we're between you and lunch right now. So the thing that we want to do, I'm Justin Shipman. I'm regional vice president at Genworth. I cover 14 states for fixed annuities. Scott Westfall is our regional vice president covering how many states on the life side? Six states. Six states. We're going to divide this presentation up for you, though. I'm going to talk about the beginning part of the presentation, how to create engaged clients. And uh, Scott's going to talk about how to uh, foster those relationships. So green button, right? Green button? OK. So let's see if it works. One of the things that Eric talked about, and that, by the way, everybody should have a kit here now. Does everybody have a kit? OK. For those of you who do, if you open it up on the right-hand side, you get a copy of the PowerPoint and then also an exercise workbook. So as you get the kits, if you can open it up, pull out the PowerPoint presentation, that would be great. That way, you don't have to write notes furiously. You actually do have a copy of it. And then underneath that, there's an exercise workbook that we're going to talk about. And really, what we want to do today is take a look at your business and, and help you work on your business instead. So anybody here a car enthusiast? OK, this is where you can raise your hands. It's OK, right? I got lucky. I, my rental car is a Camaro. So kind of a fun car to drive, right? It's fun to look under the hood at a Camaro and check out the engine. And if you're a car enthusiast or if you love baking, right? you got to check on things every once in a while, right? But when we take a look at our business, how often do we check under the hood? How often? Do we check yearly? Do we check every couple of years? Do we just think it's going to keep working on its own? And what I've found by doing these meetings across the country is that most times when we talk to agents, uh, they don't really work on their business. They don't take a look at what they're doing, what's actually driving their business. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So you know, with practice management, we're, we're going to talk about creating engaged clients. And we'll go through what an engaged client means to you. But we'll also talk about you know, how you can create those engaged clients and actively listen to what your clients are looking for. So now let me tell you that your engaged clients are not going to be your D-level clients. And by the way, everybody does label their clients in their database, right? ABC. If you aren't, you should take a look at labeling and knowing your top customers and knowing your bottom customers. We'll talk more about that. We'll also talk about the right fit, making sure that the clients that you work with are going to be clients that will help you out. We'll talk about fostering those engaged clients and, and creating a goal-based conversation instead of just a product conversation as well. And then we'll talk about what's being left on the table. Because what we've been able to do with this presentation and with the system that we have at Genworth is help agents like you double your revenue. Everybody heard that, right? Double your revenue. Is that, that a good goal? OK, so I'm not going to tell you that you need to do everything that we're going to talk about today. You need to implement one piece at a time. So over the next three months, take one of the ideas that you have from this presentation, implement it in your business, then take another idea and implement it in your business too. Because we know it's going to help you grow your revenue. And that's why Brokers Alliance wanted us here today. You know, and it's also going to talk about building those lasting relationships with your best customers and what you need to do as the next step. So it's important to point out that this is not a product pitch today. And it's not really intended to change your product mix. Now, of course, we're going to ask you to sell Genworth products. That's how Scott and I get paid. So hopefully you'll be able to do that, right? And when we take a look at, at uh, you know, 
the, how we got this information, Genworth actually purchased a company called Quantivus. Now, Quantivus, for those of you in Southern California, you might be familiar with Quantivus already. It's actually a coaching system that if you want to go through the full program, you can do that. It's going to cost you $15,000 to do it, but if you're doubling your revenue, that's worth it. What we're going to ask you to do is just do $15,000 of premium with us. Now, on the life side, Scott's going to have a good year if you do $15,000 of life premium every single person in this room. On the annuity side, I need a little bit more than that, right? That hardly even qualifies for our minimum premium on the contract. But Quantivus basically has taken best practices from agents across the country, and that's all we're going to share today. So again, it's not a product pitch. So when we take a look at creating an engaged client, let's see if we can move this forward here, it's important to define what share of wallet means to you. And traditionally, what share of wallet has meant is that I have a client and I end up selling more. I end up adding new products or services to create a bigger share of wallet. I'm getting more revenue from that client. But we think that that's kind of limiting when you're defining share of wallet. And you know, what we want you to think about is how do we get those best clients, your best customers, to actually work for you? How do you, how do you get them to engage their friends, their family members, to bring business to you? That's what we think share of wallet means. Because after all, what's better if you go out to five clients and sell five more products? Or having those five clients help represent you and bring more clients to you. Makes more sense to have those clients, your best customers, actually help build your business. And that's, we'll give you ideas on how to do that. So if we take a look at what we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna break it up into two different sections, the creating the engaged clients. I'll talk about a client survey, I'll talk about the target client profile, then Scott's gonna wrap up talking about how do you foster those engaged clients. How do you take a look at things like a, a prospect agenda or a services summary or setting annual goals and opportunity reviews with your best customers? And then it'll wrap up by talking about a marketing plan. You know, by the way, how many people here do marketing? Okay, good. You know, I asked that in a meeting with 20 agents. No one raised their hand. Kind of scary. And it's important to do marketing today. And I have a story to tell you about marketing and creating engagement. One of the guys that we work with is Jeff Christensen. He's in Salt Lake City. His uncle does LASIK surgery. In fact, he's probably the best known LASIK surgeon in Utah. He, he's so well known, he's actually opening up a new LASIK surgery building. It's a 50,000 square foot building that he's having built for LASIK surgery. 50,000 square feet, that's phenomenal. He has 50 to 60 employees at this building. He advertises so much that people know him. In fact, he advertises so much that the chopper shows that they have on TV, where you actually can have a chopper made, he's going to have that done, have that advertising, and have the chopper in the lobby of the new building. He spends a lot of money on advertising. But he's building a 50,000 square foot building. That's huge. LASIK surgeon, I had LASIK surgery. I can tell you, the LASIK surgeon did not have a 50,000 square foot office. And when you take a look at today's economy, an optional surgery like that, the other LASIK surgeons in Utah are having a difficult time. So I know a lot of you raised your hand saying you're doing marketing. For those of you who, who aren't doing marketing, how's your business going? Is it going up? Is it staying the same? Or is it going down? My guess would be that it probably, if it's going up, you're really good. But it's probably staying the same, right? And if you do marketing, you can actually create these engaged clients and, and find out what the best way is to talk to those clients. So let's take a look at the client survey here. And, and you know, really, when we talk about the engaged client, it's about creating satisfied, loyal clients. People that want to help you grow your business. Makes sense, right? Our best friends, our best clients want to help us grow our business. You know, if you ask them for help, I would bet that they'll be able to help you out. Right? Have you ever done it? If you ask them for help, do they help? Absolutely, right? I know if I ask my best customers for help, 
they'll help me out. So, you know, and the best customers are really customers that the needs and the goals of your business align with their needs and goals as well. And even the products that you offer. If you only work with the retirement market and you're selling disability, that doesn't work very well, right? So we're offering products and services that meet our marketplace today. And when we take a look at that, you know, engagement starts with the right fit. This is actually one of the studies that Quantivus did. And, and when we take a look at the percent of the client base that meets a target client profile, top performers traditionally, much more of their target base meets their target client profile than the bottom performers do. 68%, that's a pretty big number. Now, I'm not here to say that every customer has to meet your target client profile, but if you know who you want to work with, you're actually going to get to be known within that marketplace as well. So when we take a look at other information, these engaged clients expect to have three or more touches each year. So how many times do you talk to your best customers? Do you go out, do you do an annual review? Do you go out and do a social function with them? Do you send them newsletters? They expect to have three or more touches each year. 63% of those engaged clients said that they expect to have three or more touches each year. Scott's gonna talk about the length of time that they wanna actually meet with you, but they also wanna ask about, have you ask about feedback. Who's here done a client survey in the past? Okay, how'd it work for you? Work good? Yeah. You, get, you get information back that you might not have known? Absolutely, right? And so asking for feedback of your best customers is a good thing to do. So when we take a look at you know, the things that we're gonna talk about, we'll talk about developing a client survey. This is to get feedback from your best customers. Have you ever asked your customers how they would like to give you a referral? Think about it. Certain customers are very open. They'll just you know, bring out the Rolodex, right? Or their phone book or their smartphone and say, oh, you need to call this person, this person, this person. But other people might want your business card and they'll give your business card to, to someone that they know. So think about developing a client survey, de developing a target client profile. Who is the best customer that you can work with? And how do I get known within that specific marketplace? We'll also take a look at creating engaged clients through goals-based prospect agendas, not product. You know, I, I, I would be willing to bet most of you don't have a product agenda here now. It's more about what the customer needs. But we have to remind people sometimes. In a services summary, a services summary is basically an easy way to let your customers know what you do for a living. And after all, how many of you had people go to someone else for long-term care insurance? We hear the stories. Our clients go someplace else because they didn't know that we worked with that product. Well, let's tell our customers what we do for a living so that they don't go someplace else and that client services summary can help you do that. We'll talk about those annual goals, the opportunities, and we'll also talk about creating a 12-month marketing calendar as well. So if we take a look at the client survey here, what you're gonna find is that clients wanna be asked for input. In fact, 74%, almost three out of every four of your best customers wanna be asked for input. So I like that we have a few people in the audience that have actually asked and done a client survey. The reason why you do client surveys is to let find out how to best work with your best customers, right? And if you don't do a client survey, you're only guessing. And sometimes when you guess, you don't necessarily get all the right information back. So normally people will say, well, you know, they don't ask me if I talk about doing a client survey, they don't say, well, how do I do it? They ask, well, why should I do it, right? Because you're all pessimistic, right? Think of that, well, wait a minute, this guy from Genworth, even though they own this company, that's a coaching system, why should we do a client survey? Well, it basically lets you translate the feedback from your best customers into an action plan. It helps make sure that you're providing all the different services and products that they expect you to be able to offer. And if you don't want to offer those products, you can team up with someone that does. It also helps to identify those clients at risk. It helps make sure that you're asking the, those clients how to get referrals from them. 
as well, and it'll highlight cross-selling opportunities for you. So a client survey can do a lot of good things for you. Overall, it's going to get those, in, those clients that you're working with already, they'll be more engaged because it's important enough for you to ask them their input. Now, I will tell you, when you do a client survey and you get feedback and your best client is like way different than what everybody else says you should be doing, you need to let them know and send out information, maybe in a newsletter, that here's the results of my survey. So if nine out of 10 people say they want this and the one best customer says they want this, you need to let that best customer know that here's the result of my survey and here's what I'm gonna be able to do, right? So it's gonna create better retention, greater share of wallet, and receiving feedback lets you help monitor those customers as well. Maybe things have changed in their life. This is an opportunity for you to find out if there's a, a needs-based sale there or goals, goals have changed. So how do you do that? How do you create a client survey? Well, obviously, first you have to define your objectives. Who do you want to talk to? Who do you want to get the information from? You need to develop your survey. By the way, I would tell you, keep the survey short. And anybody here use SurveyMonkey at all? SurveyMonkey is an electronic survey process. Um, so www.surveymonkey.com. Sounds crazy, but it works extremely well. Do a three to five question survey email it out to your customers, and amazingly, a lot of people fill out the surveys for you. And if anybody's surfed the internet lately, who here's got a pop-up box asking if you want to complete a survey? Everybody, right? If you're on the internet now, now why are companies doing that? They want to get the information on your, you know, what you're looking for, what your buying patterns are. Same thing with this client survey. You're looking for buying habits, what your customers are looking for. And you know, if you have Series 6, Series 7, you've got to submit the survey to, to the compliance department, send your survey out, and then leverage those results. And by leveraging those results, I mean report them back to your customers that you surveyed, and maybe even more customers, and then implement what they're asking you to do, right? And one question might be, is how can I help you best? Would it be better if I did you know, an annual meeting with you, a group meeting, different things like that? How do you want me to work with you? And leverage your results. Your best customers are telling you how they want to work with you. Go ahead and implement that in your business. Because by doing that, those customers are going to feel that you're, list you're listening to them, and they're going to actually help create other engaged clients for you bring in their friends, bring in their associates, bring in their business counterparts as well. And now, surveys, sometimes people get afraid and they say, okay, well, wait a minute, that takes a lot of time to do. How do I develop a survey? Should I outsource that or should I insource that? The good news is within your kits on the left-hand side, there is a, a, a review piece on how to do the surveys, and it's up to you to decide if you want to keep those internally and just do that quick survey, or if you want to bring it out to somebody else. And we also have a, a survey best practices guide. We have the economics of loyalty, the advisor impact study in your kit as well. Great reading material for you to work on your business. But I'm going to highly suggest you take a look at implementing a client survey. And for those of you who raised your hands, maybe other people can ask you, how does it work for you? How do you do it? Because we know it works. We know it's going to increase your revenue, and we want to help you increase your revenue. So if we take a look at target client profiles, I know when I first started in, in the business, I started in 1993 with Mutual of Omaha. I learned a lot from Mutual of Omaha. In career agencies, you get to learn a lot. But you go market to pretty much anyone, right? And now I'm like, well, wait a minute here. I want to be a little bit more focused on who I target and it's funny, I was talking to an agent in Hawaii, because I have Hawaii, terrible job I have. And uh, we were talking about a client, and this client had called into him and, and was asking questions about life insurance. And the agent did his job. He ended up answering the questions, and, and the client would ask the questions again. Anybody have this happen to him, right? Client's not listening to him. He states the answers again. Client asks again, so the client is not listening to what the agent's telling them. 
And the agent's kind of fed up with it, and he goes, well, you know what? I think it might be better if you take your business elsewhere, if you go down the street. And the client's like, well, wait a minute. Are, are you rejecting me? Well, the agent goes, well, yeah, I guess I am rejecting you. And the client's like, well, you can't reject me. The agent says, well, yes, I can. I, I have this little button here right next to my phone. It's my rejection button, and I'm going to hit it right now. E and the client, of course, is fuming, right? Because this agent just rejected this customer that called in about a life insurance policy. So customer is saying, well, you know what? I need to talk to your manager. What's your name? What's your first name? Agent said, well, my first name's Fred. What's your last name? Flintstone? <laughs> sure enough, manager got a call looking for Fred Flintstone. And uh, you know, manager figured out who it was. But the moral of the story is that we can reject customers that we don't think are the right fit for us. And a target client profile helps us define who we work with best. And when we take a look at, at a target client profile, it helps us identify the key criteria for ideal clients. And I'll, I'll go through a sample here in just a little bit. But it's really clients who you do your best work with. And I know if I asked every single one of you, you would say I do my best work with this particular marketplace. You already know this. But are you telling your customers that this is who I do my best work with? Target client profiles can help you align your strategies and help make it easier to create those engaged clients. And, and when you focus on the right clients, doesn't mean you have to exclude everybody else, but it just means that you're doing the majority of your work with that target client profile. So the benefits of creating that is that you're going to be extremely focused. And what happens when we get focused? We do better, right? If I'm focusing on my golf swing, just like you yesterday, right? Some of you might have focused more than others, right? If you're focusing, you're doing a better job. And it's going to help attract clients to your target market because the clients that you work with will tell them that Joe does this. He's my agent. She's my agent. They do a great job. They know what we have to deal with. They this really positions you as the go-to person within your business as well, and it helps create a repeatable process. And it's interesting. One of the things that we found with, with Quantivus is that repeatable, efficient practices help make you money. So something that you can easily duplicate and let clients know that you do is going to help you make money. Think about it. If you don't have to create a new story, a new elevator speech every single time you run into a potential client, how much easier is that going to be? A lot easier. This is what you're doing. You're creating a client profile that lets clients know that this is who you work with best. That's all. Doesn't mean you're excluding other people, but it's really making you kind of identified as that expert. So when we take a look at the target client profile, we know 68% of top performers' clients base meet that target client profile. And when we take a look at how to do that, well, you need to know your marketplace. You know, who, who, what's your vision? What's your goal? What's your model that you want to work with? Do you only want to work 30 hours a week at between these certain times? You need to know yourself. You need to know your marketplace. If you're looking at working with astronauts and you don't live in Houston or Cape Canaveral, How's that going to work for you? Probably not very good. I don't know, Joe, astronauts here in Phoenix? I don't know. Probably not a good idea, right? So help define your, your client profile details and then write a description. And then you need to implement this. And all the tools that we're talking about, you really need to implement within your business place. Because you're just sharing information with your best customers. And by sharing that information, they can share it with their friends. And by the way, who do we hang out with? People that are like us or somebody totally different? People that are like us, right? So I'm going to help you replicate those best customers by helping implement this in your business. So if we take a look at brainstorming it, do I work with a lot? There are there a lot of people at work you know, in the same marketplace? And I love it because we all say we work with the affluent client marketplace, right? What's that mean? What's that mean? I need to define what the affluent client marketplace means to me. 
So, how large is the population? If I want to work with doctors in the Phoenix area here that have five or more employees, I can define that very, very well. And what, are you referred by clients within that profession? Well, maybe those people like you. Maybe that's a target client profile that you should be working with. And when we take a look at other financial professionals focusing on the same marketplace, I'll tell you, I'm not as worried about that, right? Because we can make ourselves unique within the marketplace. But if you have 2,000 people marketing in the same marketplace, or I have 20, which one might make more sense? You get to figure it out. So brainstorm your target client profile. And this is in your workbook. I'm not going to take a lot of time here. But we're going to ask you to focus on what type of values, what type of business style that you work with, what type of interests the clients have or different hobbies, what type of professions do they work with, and where do all these things meet together? Because when you find out where all those things meet together, that helps define that target client profile. So we invite you to do the exercise. It's in the right-hand side of your book in the second handout there. And when we take a look at creating that engaged client profile, whoops, we'll go back one here, um, it might come up with something like this. I know that my target client profile, I do my best work with clients that are between age 35 and 40. In fact, I like working with family practice physicians, and I live in Santa Rosa in the Bay Area in Northern California. That's where I want to work. So typically, their family situation is that they're married, they do have children, and their annual income is $250,000 or more. Their personality trait is that they're a delegator. They want someone to do the job for them not be involved with having to do all the details of the job. So if I write that down and put it in a description, well now what we're doing is we do our best work with family practice physicians in the Bay Area who are accumulating wealth to secure their retirement and provide a legacy for their family. That's the affluent client marketplace, right? If you work with family practice physicians, you're going to make a lot of money. I'm going to invite you to take a look at who you do your best work with and write it down and start letting people know who you do your best work with. So now what we get to do is we get to take a look at uh, fostering those relationships. And I'm going to hand this off to Scott here. So following the principal, following a comedian, following your peer. None of the three are good. We had to arm wrestle to see who went first today. Um, so today we're, I'm going to take off and t talk about uh, fostering engaged clients. So really, um, who here believes that your business is really built on relationships, right? So how do you build relationships if you're not communicating with your clients? And communication is the key, and you're going to hear me talk about that through the entire, uh, through, through the remaining presentation, that and implementation. So uh, with the, the prospect agenda and the services summary, we're going to start with there. There we go. So let's start from the beginning. Why do customers actually come to you? Well, they probably come to you because they are looking for a specific product. But in reality, they're not coming to you for a product. They're coming to you so you can uh, try to fulfill a problem with a, a solution that they currently have. So you've got to get it in your mindset that you really need to have a goals-based conversation with them. And then think about, do your clients know when to come to you? Do they know that life events or triggers are times where they need to reach out to you and maybe go over uh, the coverage that they currently have? So you need to think about that as we're going through this section about the, the goals-based conversations. So you've got to set the tone from the very beginning that this is a goals-based conversation. So. Um, it might seem a little harder than you think it is, but uh, we set up a couple of tools for you to use, including the prospect meeting agenda and the services summary. So the prospect meeting agenda is just something that helps you outline the work that you do with them, keeps you on track. And then the services summary, as he mentioned earlier, is just kind of a listing of all the things that you do as a financial advisor, as an insurance agent, that your firm offers to ensure that they know during those life events who to call. So what are some of the benefits of a goals-based conversation? Well, first of all, it limits that one and done. It limits that, hey, I need a uh, $100,000 term life insurance policy. Done. Sold. Get out of my office. It allows you to have a much broader 
conversation include multiple products and services, which will help you increase your share of wallet. So how do you develop a goals-based conversation? Um, well, start with the, the prospect meeting agenda. So the prospect meeting agenda, again, as I mentioned before, it really helps you focus on the why that the person came to you versus the what they came to you for. So the why meaning the, the problem that they need to solve for versus I need that term insurance policy for $100,000. And then develop supplemental materials. So like the services summary that really demonstrates fully what you and your firm can do for them. And then what was supposed to be in the kits, and it is, and I apologize, um, is the let's talk materials. So the let's talk, and if you wouldn't mind writing this down for me, it's www.genworth.com forward slash let's talk advisor. And on that site, you can actually get some of the materials that I uh, and, and will be referring to throughout the rest of the presentation. So then you need to determine when and how to use the materials because each customer is a little bit different. You certainly can't use the same uh, materials with each customer. And then obviously, implement. So again, that uh, recurring theme. You gotta communicate and you have to implement. So in here, we've included a prospect meeting agenda sample. And within this sample, again, it focuses on the why. So here's a just an area where you can write down some of your goals and objectives so you can follow it in your meetings to keep them running smoothly and keep you on task, keep the customer on task. I don't know if any of you have experienced this. I certainly have, where I've had a customer in my office and they've run the entire conversation because I can't get them to shut up, you know? So being able to have this goals and objectives lined up and you can give it to them ahead of time so they know kind of where you want to run with the conversation, very helpful. And then it leaves a, a small section on there for you to talk more about your firm and a little bit about what you offer, your philosophy, your firm's philosophy. And then getting back to the goals-based conversations with the supplemental marketing materials, these are really designed to help you take the converse conversation further than you would without these uh, supplemental materials. So with the, uh, the services summary, I just want you to keep in mind that this will actually help your, you uncover needs and goals that your customers have without you actually having to, to start digging with them. So it lets the customers know everything that you offer right up front so it allows them to start thinking ahead of time, oh, you offer annuities? Well, I hadn't thought about that. Oh, long-term care. Oh my gosh, can you tell me a little bit more about that? And then of course the Let's Talk materials. So we at Genworth, we developed, um, the, the Let's Talk program. I don't know if any of you have seen it yet, but it covers um, all three product lines that we offer today. So it covers the life insurance, the long-term care, and the retirement income or the annuity section. All great pieces, great tabloids. A lot of agents are using this to really drive that conversation a little further and make it a more fruitful conversation. So, can you go back one? I thought maybe I skipped ahead too far. Sorry about that. All right. So just in a real quick summary, we covered the prospect meeting agenda. Really, again, just to keep you and the customer on task. Allows you to have a, a much more broader conversation. Lets them know that you're listening to them. And by you listening to them, they value the conversations that you're having a little bit more. Then the services summary sample, again, tells them everything that you and your firm, your agency can do for them so they don't have to go looking elsewhere and you lose a sale, as he was talking about before. And then of course the Let's Talk program, anything to make the conversation that you have with them, some of them are seemingly tough conversations, take it a little bit further. And by tough conversations, I mean like, you know, having to talk about putting a parent into a nursing home. That way you can talk about uh, the long-term care and the, the tabloid that we have out there is really good about uh, explaining to a customer and in ways they can understand and helps them open up the conversation with their loved ones. So I urge you definitely to take a look at that website and uh, peruse the materials that are out there. So next we're gonna move on to the annual goals and opportunities review to continue fostering the, uh, the engaged clients that you've uh, worked on already, that you've already created. And in this section, we're gonna talk about what's being left on the table. What have you not talked about? What are you missing? What are, what, what are the opportunities that you're missing out on? So this is the annual review uh, defined. I'm not gonna, you can read this slide faster than I can, can talk to it, but um, so who here has kids that are in junior high or high school and play a, a sport? So 
halfway through the game, your team is losing. What does the coach do? He comes in, he makes some adjustments, tweaks a couple of things. Look at this analogy as an annual review. If you don't have your customers come in for an annual review, how do you know when things have changed in their lives? How do you know when you can help them out? So think of it uh, more in those terms. So in reality, two things. One, agents think customers don't want to come in for reviews. And two, they think they're going to be really time consuming and a waste of time. But studies have shown, we have a, um, a uh, life jacket study out right now where we, Genworth, partnered with the University of Virginia. We surveyed roughly 26,000 individuals, which is a statistically significant number. Wow, I said that right. Um, a statistically significant number. And in there, it said that 47% of the respondents said that they wanted to have an annual review. But more importantly, they don't want it to last very long. This isn't about a three, four, five, six hour uh, review. It's, they want it to be an hour or less. And 30%, or I'm sorry, 37% want it to be 30 minutes or less. So this is something that you can do on a very quick basis. And you need to do an 80-20. You don't have to do this with every single one of your customers. You need to pick your best customers. Go for those and do your annual, annual reviews with those. So in this slide, the goals-based annual review benefits for you, and the one that really resonates with me the most is that it positions you as a trusted financial professional, not just as a salesperson. You're not just another guy or girl out there just trying to make another buck. You're actually trying to help them create a financial security for their family, right? And this also helps increase the whole share of wallet. So how do you develop an annual goals and opportunities review? Well, first of all, you, got, you have to create a very systematic process, and we're going to show you a real quick example of that as well, and it's in your, your workbook as well, um, where you're just going to review the client's goals, make sure they're still in line with the way that they had given you before, and then talk about the products and the solutions that you already have in place for them and make sure they're the right solutions that you have in place for them. Then obviously, identify the clients that you want to include. Again, the 80-20 rule, per Pareto's principle. Figure out the ones that will make you the most money and stick with those and do the review with those. And you don't have to do every one of them face to face. Do some of them via the phone. Do some of them via email. So it's not something that you've got to set a meeting and they've got to come in, you've got to, to take the time and, and the effort out of your day to, to manage that. And then obviously implement, implement, implement. So here's a sample of the systematic review process. And um, we provided it in here because Sometimes it's difficult to, to start from scratch. However, this is so simple, it's child's play. It's really easy. I mean, step one, you gotta call them and set up the meeting. Wow, that's brain surgery right there. Um, two, you gotta gather the materials, put them all together. Three, not only do you have to put the materials together, but if you're not the one that has to put the materials together, you need to review it before they get in there to make sure that you've got the right materials in front of you. Four, send a, 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 a reminder to them. This does two things. One, it's just a, a, a friendly reminder, it kind of gets you top of mind with them. But two, it's a reciprocation thing. It's a do and an ask. I'm gonna send you a reminder, I'm asking you to come in, they're mo more likely to come in and see you. And then five, hold the meeting. Oh wow, another brain surgery uh, uh, technique right there. Um, but six, and six is the most important one. Six is where the real ask comes in. So six is where you send a follow-up. This is what I'm gonna do for you. This is what I need you to do for me. This is the stuff that we discussed, and this is how we're gonna implement the plan. Then you get them to, to follow through with that and, and move on, and there you've increased share of all. So we had an Excel-based tool. Um, we actually changed that around. It's in your packet now as a, as a brochure, but it kind of goes into a little bit deeper about the whole opportunities review and how to, how to uh, perform one of those. So finally, we're gonna move on to the 12-month marketing calendar. And this isn't about marketing a product or a solution to them necessarily. It's really about being top of mind. So in definition, you know, it's up there to, to create the systematic process and run forward with it, which will help you increase share of wallet. The idea, though, before we get into is that there are a few different myths around marketing. So one, the first myth that we want to talk about and address is that if you market today, 
you'll get revenue tomorrow. Who believes that? Well, it's, it's actually very difficult for that to happen. If you market today in all actuality, and you do it systematically, you will yield results. It's just not necessarily gonna to be tomorrow. It's gonna to be a few months down the line. Just make sure you do it on a consistent basis. The second one is that marketing is gonna be incredibly expensive. Well, that's up to you. If you wanna spend a ton of money on a topper and put it in your office, you can do that, but that's, uh, those are few and far between, and industry studies show that isn't really the direction to go. Three is that your plan has to be incredible, is gonna be frustrating and overwhelming for you. Again, that's up to you, it doesn't have to be. Really, simplicity is better. More is not better, better is better. And by being better, it, and by being simplistic, it enables you to put together a plan that you'll be able to stick with, and if you can stick with it, you're more, uh, more likely to accomplish your goals. Right. So we put together a real easy marketing plan for your marketing calendar, and that's in your workbook right now. Um, so the 12-month the marketing calendar defines who you're gonna target, what you're gonna send to them, how often you're gonna send to them, and how much money you're gonna spend. So you segregate your clients into your A, B, Cs, and Ds, you do some things for your A's that you won't do for your D's, clearly, because your A's mean something to you, right? But if you put it on a piece of paper and outline it out, you're more likely to follow the plan throughout the entire year. So a couple of things that this does for you, and it builds your credibility incredibly as a financial uh, person that uh, they're working with, but it definitely keeps you top of mind, and obviously the more often you're in front of them, the more likely they're gonna know when they have life events that they need to come back and, and see you and talk to you about them. So how do you create a 12-month marketing calendar? So first of all, it starts with you. You've got to define what your goals are. What are you trying to achieve over the next 12 months? And how do you want to go about doing it? And then research and identify the campaigns that you want to do. So um, one of the other myths that I forgot to mention is that you've got to be extremely creative as, um, as a salesperson. I'm a salesperson. There's not a creative bone in this body. And most salespeople I know don't have creative bones in their body. So that's where you need to rely on carriers like Genworth, more importantly, Brokers Alliance, as, because they have several professionals, and the other carriers that are represented here today. We come up with plenty of uh, items that uh, you can utilize to do your marketing. Then you have to define your focus group, and this goes back to your A, B, Cs, and Ds, right? Whoa, I didn't touch it. <laughs> um, and then design your calendar, and then there you go again. The word is up there, implement, 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 right? So there are two best practices when it comes to marketing. So there are systematized, and there are specialized events that you can handle. Um, the systematized are real easy, usually like email campaigns, things like that, that don't take a lot of your time. You can hit a lot of people, and it's consistent communications. The second is more specialized, so the events that you throw for your top producer, or, um, uh, top clients, top clients that uh, you know, definitely draw the most benefit to you, your centers of influence. Um, and then we'll go into a couple of different uh, uh, examples of each. So first of all, um, getting to the case studies. So as I mentioned before, rely on Brokers Alliance, rely on some of the carriers. We create, create these all the time, you don't have to. And then you can take these types of um, case studies, send them out to your clients, say, well, first you gotta utilize some of them to make sure you're, you're good at them. Um, but say, hey, I had a customer, came in, this is the problem, this is how we uh, came up with a solution. Solution. Do you have somebody that you know, or do you have a, a problem like this that I can help you solve? That, will uh, again, keeps you top of mind with them. It's something you can blast out to everybody, very system systematized and very easy. The next one I like a lot. Who's ever heard of Rob Shore? Yeah, okay, one person, two people. <laughs> Rob Shore created something called the MQ, or the Memorability Quotient. Um, I usually say memorabilia, so I've got to always think that one out. Um, the memorability quotient. So how, are you just another suit to these people, or are you somebody that they'll remember off the uh, top of their head? You do something extra for them. So two real quick examples of that. We've got um, one uh, uh, person who, you know, for example, 
you, you've got your top client, you know they want to go to Greece, you're at a bookstore, you see the top 10 places to visit in Greece, you buy it, you drop in the mail, say, hey, I was at the bookstore, saw this, thought of you, hope you have a great trip, you know? They know that you care about them, they value, they know that you value their time and their business. Second, and the, this is the one that I uh, got from Rob Shore, it had an internal wholesaler utilize this, uh, Thanksgiving, not a huge holiday, not a Hallmark holiday, not for, for most of us anyhow. But he would send out emails to all of his clients, all of his customers, all of his BGAs, and say, hey, it's Thanksgiving. You know, I hope you really enjoy the time off and the time with your family. But hey, in case you run into trouble, here's a phone number, 1-800-BUTTERBALL. 1-800-BUTTERBALL. Here's some things that they can do for you just in case you run into trouble. He's top of mind. It's something that he did, it, it has nothing to do with our business, right? Another one is barbecue tips for 4th of July. That's another really good one. No one sends a card for 4th of July. I don't think they make those. And then of course the, the networking events, um, the, the more specialized, and you guys know how to do those, the, the luncheons, the, the client events, the golf games, things like that. So I just want to take just a minute because we talked about some different ideas that we had out there, and I want to see if you guys have any um, great ideas around marketing or events or things that you've done with any of your clients. Well, I, who, who here sends birthday cards out? You know, some clients, it's the only card they get, right? Yep. So that's a marketing event, sending a birthday card. Yep. And you can actually go to Hallmark Business now have your logo, your company name printed on business cards, they'll even send them out for you. You provide the Excel spreadsheet with the client's names. So, very easy. Yeah, extremely easy to do. So think about that and think about some of the other ideas. And we've included some ideas in the uh, workbook as well for you, so just take a look at those. So we talked about the 12-month marketing tool, and it's, again, not Excel-based anymore. It's, in, it's a workbooklet in there. In your, uh, in your kit, and we talked about some best practices. So now we're just gonna kind of wrap it up and tie it all, all together. So we gave you a lot of ideas and a lot of tools. Now it's just time to pull them all together and think about some that you wanna implement. And it's all about increasing the share of wallet with the clients that you currently have and dig deeper into, uh, in, into the solutions that you can offer to them. So, with uh, um, the study that we did, or with uh, um, Quantivist and the study they did, engaged clients feel really valued, and valued clients have a lot of trust for you, and they trust that you'll take care of their loved ones, eventually running into the fact that you're gonna get re um, referrals from them. So just keep that in mind. And it's all about increasing share of wallet, not only with them, but with your customers. So, You'll, you'll notice a, a theme here, so it's all about engaged clients. So the first half was really about creating the engaged clients, and the second half is really about uh, fostering those engaged clients. So we just ask that you take a couple of tools, and um, so our ask of you today is to pick out a few of those tools. And we're not asking you to, to try to do every one of them. In fact, we're telling you not to do every one of them because you will fail. There is no way that you can spread yourself so thin and thin and do all of them. So pick you know one or two, implement them over the next 30 months, utilize uh, Brokers uh, Alliance for a resource. And then the other thing that we have to offer with the, with the help of Quantivus is we do have three additional webinars, and I'll be working with Brokers Alliance to put on those webinars to see if we can't uh, uh, provide that additional value to that will go deeper into the individual tools themselves. And then you need to create an action plan for yourself um, and set your goals and do that 12-month calendar even for yourself. And then finally, as I was talking, the consistent theme is all about implementation. Implement, implement, implement. So just to open it up to any questions that you may have.